Welcome everyone and thank you so much for joining us today. I'm Kate Tuttle, a Senior Marketing Manager at Proficient, and I'm excited to be moderating today's webinar on the role of data lakes in healthcare. Today's session will provide an overview of data lakes and their role in healthcare, and outline several of the key use cases driving adoption of data lakes for both providers and health plans. We are recording today, and we will be sure to email you with information on how to access this after the session. Time permitting, we will answer questions at the end of the presentation, so please type those in the chat box in the lower left corner of your window. In a moment, I'll hand it over to our speakers, but first let me give you a quick overview of Proficient. Proficient is the leading digital transformation consulting firm serving global 2000 and enterprise customers throughout North America. With unparalleled information technology management consulting and creative capabilities, Proficient and its Proficient Digital Agency deliver vision, execution, and value with outstanding digital experience, business optimization, and industry solutions. We have a broad network of locations across the U.S. as well as offshore facilities in India and China. We deliver digital experience, business optimization, and industry solutions that cultivate and captivate customers, drive efficiency and productivity, integrate business processes, improve productivity, reduce costs, and create a more agile enterprise. Founded in 1997, we are a public traded company with more than 3,000 employees. We've formed strategic partnerships with each of the major technology vendors and also have dedicated solution and industry practices. Proficient's national healthcare practice is recognized as one of the largest healthcare consulting firms in the U.S. We provide strategic technology consulting insights that help our healthcare clients transform with today's digital consumer experience demands. This strategic guidance is then transformed into pragmatic technology solutions that improve clinical, financial, and operational efficiency while dealing with the complexities of regulatory reform and the enablement of innovation. Now let's meet our speakers. Juliet Silver is the Director of Enterprise Strategy within Proficient's Healthcare Practice. Juliet provides strategic thought leadership and leverages her more than 20 years of healthcare industry, management consulting, and technology experience to support healthcare clients in the realization of their strategic vision. Jill Corcoran is a Senior Technical Architect within Proficient's Healthcare Practice. Jill has more than 20 years of consulting experience focused on helping clients solve complex business challenges by providing enterprise, data, and business intelligence architectural solutions that transform the way they think about, organize, and leverage their data. Now before we get started, uh, we would like to do a quick poll so that we can get a good gauge on where our audience is in terms of their organization's approach to data management. So if you could just take a, a few seconds here to answer this question, what is your organization's approach to data management? We have an Enterprise Data Warehouse. We have an Enterprise Data Warehouse and Data Lake. We have an Enterprise Data Warehouse and are considering a Data Lake. We do not have an Enterprise Data Warehouse or we're just not sure what to do. So we'll go ahead and um, give you a few seconds here to answer that. And it, it looks like um, a lot of folks here have an Enterprise Data Warehouse. Um, some do have a combination. And um, you know we've got a, a few people here who just aren't sure what to do, and, and we're hoping that today's webinar can help um, help guide you on on what would make most sense for your organization. All right, I'm going to go ahead and close that poll out, and with that, I will go ahead and turn it over to Juliet. Thank you, Kate, and welcome everyone. We're glad that you could join us today. As Kate mentioned. Um, in the introduction, I work in strategy and advisory services, supporting healthcare clients with BI and analytic strategy and roadmaps. And we've seen an increased interest from our healthcare and life sciences clients in exploring the need for a big data architecture, and more specifically a data lake, which led us to create the presentation for today's discussion. So what is a data lake? Well, it's really just a large storage repository designed to hold data assets of varied types as they're received from their sources. Data is typically managed in a Hadoop distributed file system environment where it's stored in its native form or close to its native form. So think of it as a store for raw data, which may include data from relational databases, you know, rows, columns, transform data, semi-structured data, CSV files, XML files, unstructured data, things like email, text-based documents, and even binary data, images, audio, video. In an, in an architecture that essentially provides for a 
collocation of data in various schemata and structural forms, usually object blobs or files. And there's not usually any content integration enhancement or enrichment of the data in the lake environment. So why consider a data lake? Well, first of all, it provides a comprehensive data storage environment from which to conduct research, test hypotheses, perform data mining, and undertake predictive or prescriptive analysis. The data lake is able to store and manage data that's not well suited to our pre-populated enterprise data warehouses, marks, or other operational data stores. It also allows us to manage unstructured data. And when we consider 80% of healthcare data is in fact unstructured, one can easily recognize its utility. What attracts health plans, healthcare providers, and life science organizations to a data lake is its ability to address complex use cases, what we refer to as use cases that align to the four Vs. That would be volume, velocity, variety, and veracity. And my colleague, Jill, will go into more detail around the four Vs in just a moment. We're seeing data lakes being applied for a host of use cases, such as in-depth analysis of patient outcomes to address fraud, waste, and abuse, in R&D for drugs and durable medical equipment, and to address patient member 360 and many other use cases, a few of which we're going to explore with you today in this presentation. So how does it work? Well, unlike an enterprise data warehouse, which applies a schema on write, a data lake applies a schema on read, which eliminates the necessity to transform data when bringing it into a data lake environment. This is a significant time saver and positions researchers and data scientists to leverage a variety of data as and when they need it, from which they can begin to uncover hidden correlations, obscure patterns, disease trends, and more. So is there really a need for a data lake in healthcare? During our strategy work with clients, we're often asked this question, you know, should we invest in a data warehouse or a data lake as part of our overall data environment? Should we invest in both? Of course, the answer to that question is dependent upon the types of use cases you're solving for. Since the need for a data lake is largely driven by the need to address fluid data requirements, especially when dealing with large volumes of data in batch or real time from an extensive range of sources in a variety of formats. The types of use cases we see most often are those geared toward improving medical outcomes for patients, driving patient and member engagement, and use cases to help bend the cost curve or those that foster innovation. There is, of course, an important role that an enterprise data warehouse also plays in the overall data architecture, as it's better suited to providing the strategy-driven, non-volatile, transformed data that is used to run day-to-day -day business operations, and from which we make informed business decisions based on known processes through thoroughly vetted data. The EDW is widely leveraged in traditional reporting and analytics, such as executive and operational dashboards, reports for quality and performance measures, member claims analysis, and so on. So what are some of the data lake traits? Well, there are several key traits, one of the most important being accelerated time to value. This is largely due to various tools which apply schema on read, which I mentioned earlier. In, a sch in schema on read, data is applied to a plan or schema as it's actually pulled from the stored location, rather than as it goes in, which is the case with an enterprise data warehouse. This eliminates all the upfront modeling, mapping, ETL development, and testing traditionally associated with an enterprise data warehouse, which can often impact time to value for the end user. Having ready access to data for ad hoc analysis and data mining is extremely valuable to data scientists and researchers alike. The data lake also introduces and reuses tools and processes that improve search and general knowledge of data content. And it is organized to promote more efficient access to a greater variety of data sources. It's designed for low cost storage since it's geared towards storing data in large volumes and it's also highly agile and reconfigurable. 
So next, let's review six big data use cases that have relevance for a data lake. We'll explore genomic analytics use case um, applicable to insurers, and use cases for improved clinical trials, predictive healthcare costs, member patient 360, billing opportunities in unstructured text, and psychographic prescriptive modeling. In our first use case, genomic analytics used by insurers, we explore the role the data lake has in managing genomic data. Today, genomic research has made it increasingly affordable to scan the entire genome of an individual. And we're all familiar with how researchers and physicians are already working with genomic data as part of their clinical research, trials, and precision medicine programs. What may not be as widely known, however, is how genomic data is being applied together with medical and lifestyle information as part of sophisticated risk prediction models in the insurance industry. In the UK, for example, insurers are leveraging genomic data to manage risk, working through the Genetics and Insurance Committee to establish coverage thresholds in the amount of insurance coverage for life, critical illness, and income protection for those individuals identified through genetic testing as having the HD gene for Huntington disease with applications pending for the BRCA1 and 2 gene associated with breast and ovarian cancer. In the US, the Genetic Information Non-Discrimination Act of 2008, GINA, protects Americans from discrimination based on their genetic information in both health insurance and in employment, thus limiting similar applications but one can easily envision how genomic data has a benefit in risk stratification in prevention programs in populations. You will hear about the four Vs a lot during this presentation, since big data and the need for a data lakes is driven by use cases with these characteristics. Sequenced genomics data is stored in a variety of file types, such as BAM files, VCS files, and often requires petabytes of storage. So genomics data certainly aligns to the first two Vs, volume and variety. Given we now have access to the largest ever collection of human protein coding genetic variants, I think over 10 million variants from the Exome Aggregation Consortium, the challenge for healthcare and life sciences is not so much how to use genomic data, but rather how to deal with the massive amounts of data. The next use case focuses on improved clinical trials. In a research paper titled An Analytics Approach to Designing Clinical Trials for Cancer, Dimitris Bertsimus from the Sloan School and Operations Research Center at MIT highlighted how the analysis and design of clinical trials can discover drug combinations with significant improvements for overall survival and toxicity in patients diagnosed with cancer. The challenge of identifying the best chemotherapy regimen currently available for advanced gastric cancer was the focus of the research, a task that had previously proven challenging for traditional meta-analysis, but one well suited to the methods applied in his research. Through the use of regression models, which leverage large clinical trial outcome data sets, but Simmons demonstrated the ability to control for differences in demographics and other factors across different clinical trials, enabling direct comparison of results that were not from the same randomized experiment. Existing models in this case were expanded upon by using a corpus of published research as a source of data during clinical trials. In this exemplar, the corpus of unstructured data, i.e. the published research, coupled with large clinical outcome data sets, is something a data lake is well suited to manage. Next, we'll talk about predicting healthcare costs. So whether you're a health plan or a healthcare provider, we're all in the business these days of trying to predict healthcare costs as we transition from a fee-for-service based model to value-based care. And more importantly, identifying the underlying causes or drivers of cost. Our IBM Watson team here at Perficient was directly involved in this particular use case, 
which leveraged unstructured data to develop a predictive readmission risk model for congestive heart failure. We worked with the healthcare provider in Ohio to develop a statistical regression model that estimates the readmission risk outcome using factors that may be influencing the outcome, such as demographic variables, clinical variables, social economic status variables, and utilization variables for all care types from the current year as well as the prior two years to account for degree, uh, disease progression. In this example, we can see where we identified 113 candidate predictors from both structured and understructured data sources. Interestingly though, what we found was structured data was less reliable than unstructured data, and that by increasing the reliance on unstructured data, we increase the value of the predictive model. Surfacing 18 accurate indicators or predictors. We touched early on the data lake's ability to manage unstructured data. So it's well positioned to support these types of use cases in which we're dealing with large volumes of unstructured text. So at this point in the presentation, I'm going to hand it over to my colleague, Jill, who will talk about some of her experience as a data architect solving for three additional use cases and designing and developing a data lake. So Jill, over to you to cover Member Patient 360. Thank you, Juliet. A Member 360 degree view is basically a patient index that offers access to the enterprise-wide health plan member or patient data. This includes demographics, socioeconomic characteristics, healthcare encounters, and claims and any number of other defining attributes. From the provider perspective, this view allows physicians to participate more fully in their patients, creating a better experience, and ultimately allowing hospitals and health systems to increase their profitability. In one study, the use of the 360-degree view of health plan members diagnosed with heart failure found that the use of remote monitoring integrated with the clinical and claims data facilitated earlier intervention by the member's care team and prevented avoidable hospitalizations and disease progression. This is just one example of improved decision-making and improved outcomes through the identification of preventative care. In this use case, regarding minor unstruct mining unstructured data, we found that there is a considerable amount of information about a patient contained in the practitioner's notes. However, after the initial review for billing, this information often goes largely untouched. There are a number of uses for this data when it's made available in the data lake. Initially, of course, it was found to provide correlations to the claim and encounter billing to identify exam room tests minor procedures that were performed before and after any major procedures that had heretofore gone unbilled. Additionally, when employed by a U.S. large, I'm sorry, by a large U.S. health plan that had moved from a portion of their population from fee-for-service to per-person per-month billing, they were able to identify the comorbidities and apply those risk adjustments to the aggregate population. Now, earlier in the healthcare cost use case, we saw how predictive analytics used the data lake to show what could happen. Then in the member 360, we saw how descriptive analytics used the data lake to show what has happened. And in this use case, the psychographic prescriptive analytics, we're going to show what should happen based on the data we find in the data lake. To show this, let's take a look at the oldest and perhaps most widely recognized heart study in the United States, the Framingham Heart Study. The study provided the first glimpse into risk indicators beyond basic measurable statistics like resting heart rate and blood pressure and demographics like age and gender. It actually showed us that the psychographic factors like attitude and lifestyle played an equal part. Those indicators from the Framingham study gave us the prescriptive information to tell us that we should, what the things that we should do to avoid the heart disease, you know, including eating right, exercising, using aspirin to reduce those arterial blockages. It was all a lot of good information. These few use cases that we've reviewed today and many others have been and can be accomplished with these are really well thought out, closely governed, secure data lake. The section we're about to go into will provide an overview of the candidate data sources and the architectural frameworks that can be used to design and develop a healthcare data lake. Let's start with the core of everything in IT, the data. Volume is most often the trigger that leads an organization to look at developing on a, on a new platform. It's not the only reason, though. Velocity at which the data is received and the variety of data types and sources from which the data originates play an equal part. These are the three Vs that are spoken of frequently when discussing the use cases for big data solutions. However, in the creation of a data lake, it's equally important to keep the veracity of the data in mind. 
It's this reason that the governance of the data lake is vital to its success. We need to ensure that we're pouring the data into the data lake and it's valid for the stated use. As with any data project, it's imperative that there's good communication between the data teams and the business team. And remember that your lake offers really inexpensive storage. So don't be shy about adding plenty of data to ensure the desired results. And one mistake that I see often over the last number of years, not just on data lake projects but also on data warehouses, is the desire to see the results that you or your business partners want to see. Let the data do the talking. It's okay to be wrong about a hypothesis, but it's not okay to skew your data or your findings to fit them. Now let's take a look at some of the candidate data sources for both provider and payer. First, we'll look at provider. If you work with a provider, these sources will be very familiar to you, but some of the more obscure candidate sources to keep in mind here are going to be medical device data like vital statistics or EKG readings and the accompanying notes, or log data from surgical devices and durable medical equipment. And then, of course, there's the publicly available data, like data from the CDC or from the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality. Remember that the HRQ offers data regarding cost of care, trends in hospital care, and lots more. They're a really great resource, and I have to highly recommend the use of their data. In the payer data lake, for those of you in the payer space, you'll not be surprised to find that your data lake looks a bit more crowded than the provider data, but contains a lot of the same information, with, of course, the additions of marketing data, survey data, and the billing and claim data grouped by encounter or grouped by case. But now that we have covered the data that is used to stock the lake, let's take a look at where that data lands and where the data lake resides. This is a very generic architecture for big data. And as Juliet mentioned earlier, a data lake typically resides on Hadoop. And that's what this architecture is around here. This diagram shows the various pieces and parts of the big data landscape, starting with the base, where there's the underlying security, authorization, and authentication tools running. The next layer is the governance fabric, on which the tool is designed to exchange metadata with other tools and processes, both within the Hadoop staff and outside of it, work in concert with the data lifecycle management software. This is a hugely important part of this architecture. Next is the data management stack. This is where the Hadoop Distributed File System, or HDFS, is the core. It's the distributed, scalable, Java-based file system adept at storing large volumes of structured, unstructured, semi-structured data. And this is where our data lake resides. On top of the HDFS, you will find YARN. And quite honestly, it stands for Yet Another Resource Negotiator. It's a cluster management technology. It serves as a large-scale distributed operating system for all big data applications running on HDFS. To the left, I've depicted the data exchange. This is where tools for rapidly exchanging data with HDFS come into play. There are tools there such as Scoop, Flume, Kafka, and NiFi, just to name a few. To the right is where I've noted the provisioning, monitoring, and scheduling tools. All of these are really necessary for a clean, smooth running data lake. This category includes tools such as Zookeeper and Uzi. Above HDFS and YARN, there are any number of tools that can be used to access the data better, faster, cheaper. So IT is what we do. This is a long and varied list, and an hour just isn't enough time to discuss each and every one of them and their virtues. So I'm going to review the categories with you really briefly, but please don't be offended if I don't mention your favorite tool as an example of any of these categories. Oh, and if the example tools aren't familiar to you, please don't fret. That's really the responsibility of your infrastructure or big data architect. Let's start with Batch. Batch is MapReduce. This is where developers write applications in their language of choice. They can use Java, C++, Python. And then there's scripting languages. This is where you would find Pig running on Tez Framework. Developers there use Pig Latin. Next, I have the streaming category. This is for real-time business intelligence. It includes tools like Storm. SQL on Hadoop has been previously dominated by Hive, which I'm sure everybody's heard of. But other tools include Hawk, Impala, and Shark. Shark is actually just Hive on Spark. I shouldn't say just because it's fairly important. There are a number of NoSQL options, including HBase, Cassandra, Accumulo. These are just to name a scant few. Then there's the in-memory category, which in my opinion is led by Spark. And then there's the others box. This is my catch-all. It includes all independent software vendors, or ISVs. And then above all of the data access, you'll see where I've got the user tools. This user tools box is not for your business users. This is for your data science users. Tools here would include things like Zeppelin and Ambari. And again, if you're not familiar with these, don't worry. Again, this is stuff that you want your uh, big data architects to know about. 
Now, let's take a look from the enterprise data landscape view. As you see depicted here, the data lake is a key component in the data ecosystem. But let's start with data curation. This includes the organization and integration of data collected from various sources, the annotation of the data, publication and presentation of the data. And this has to be done really carefully and methodically so that the value of the data is maintained over time and that data remains available for use, reuse, and preservation. The entire gray box covers data governance and management. I know I've already said this, but I can't stress enough how important this layer is to your enterprise data landscape. Note that this should always be led or at least co-led by your business because they're the data owners and they know their data the best. The Enterprise Information Catalog along the bottom here should contain four categories. I'm a huge proponent of all kinds of metadata, so I'm going to go through these with you real quick. First, there's structural metadata, which includes information about entities, attributes, sizes, characteristics, so on. And then there's descriptive metadata. That gives you the purpose-driven metadata like titles, abstracts, authors, keywords, that kind of thing. Next is the administrative metadata or management metadata, I guess, such as security roles, archival, preservation roles, intellectual property rights, something along that line. And can't forget audit metadata. It's imperative. The operational statistics, creation statistics, and of course the full data lineage from cradle to grave for our data. Above and to the right of the data ecosystem, I've plotted all of the users. Please note that I've sectioned off those highly skilled data professionals and the data scientists. They'll have considerably more access to your, business, your data than the business users, and they'll get really raw access. They're expected to understand and know and use all that metadata that's out there to make sure that they're using it in the right context. Your business users are your biggest pool of users. That should be no surprise to anyone. They include like the daily operations folks, BI analysts, your call centers, medical and pharmaceutical professionals, and of course your executive suite. Okay, now that we have an idea of what the data landscape will ultimately look like, let's take a look at how to introduce that data lake into our existing enterprise data ecosystem. While there are a number of ways to integrate the data lake, I've narrowed it down to the three that I've heard proposed or requested most often. Across the top, you see that the data lake is used as a data staging and transformation platform. But long-term persistence and analytics is performed solely in the EDW. And while this lowers the cost of the data capture and provides a scalable data refinement, it removes those vast capabilities that the data lake has that can offer the business users. And you can still see that we're offering the raw data access to our scientists and our data professionals, but you've eliminated the ability for those business users to go in and play in any sandboxes. Across the middle, I'm showing the data lake as the big data ecosystem. You get this request a lot. With the big data ecosystem used for long-term big data persistence and analytics without employing an EDW, it's a totally viable solution, you know, especially given that all of the tools have matured in these recent years and and they've proven to be very inexpensive. However, the overall cost of using your data lake as your entire data ecosystem has actually proven to be very expensive. For details on that, I'd have to refer you to um, what is it, the Winter Corporation study. Uh, they have a whole study on the cost of big data and how when used properly, it's very cost effective. When being used as overall as the EDW, it's very expensive because of the high number of queries. Across the bottom is my recommended scenario because it allows for the data to be harmonized and analyzed in the data lake. You can be moved out to the EDW where there are more frequently accessed queries, there's the more stringent data quality rules, where there's the data enhancements that are rigorous, rigorously applied, and where users can simply access their slice and time reporting, their basic reporting that they use on a day-to-day -day basis. This scenario is most likely to support any future data needs no matter the variety, volume, or velocity of the data. Okay, now before I share some of the best practices that I've gleaned over the past few years from the data lake projects I've architected, let's go ahead and pause for one more polling question. Kate? Thanks, Jill. All right, so what are the biggest challenges with implementing a data lake um, in your opinion or maybe you've had experience um, within your organization? And, and this is a multiple select question. So your team lacks the necessary skills. Uh, data governance and management, setting priorities for use cases, getting leadership buy-in, or something other than those four options. So it looks like data governance is a concern. Um, the use cases, priorities seems to be a concern for several. And um, so we're a little bit all over the board here. Team lacks necessary skills. 
Um, but it definitely looks like data governance and management is kind of the, the top option that people are selecting. All right, so we'll give a couple more seconds here as the results keep coming in. Um, we do have a, a few people that are having trouble getting uh, buy-in from leadership. And that looks like it's kind of slowed down, so we will go ahead and close that poll out, and I will turn it back over to Jill. Thanks. Thank you, Kate. I'm actually glad to see that everybody acknowledges that their governance is a big challenge. It's not only a big challenge, but it's the biggest payoff when it comes to the end of the data lake. Thank you all for taking the time to respond to our polling question. Now, let's take a quick look at some of the best practices that I've gathered from my past data projects. Um, I've divided them into three categories here. The first is the assessment. Now, typically prior to starting any large data project, an assessment of readiness takes place. So take a look at the questions that will be asked from the data from which the answers are expected. Ensure that all the data is there that's needed to meet the criteria of our four Vs, right? We want to make sure that they have not only the volume, but the velocity, the variety, and the veracity. It's also imperative that once an architecture has been designed, reviewed, and approved, that all teams or divisions that are going to be involved have a really good grasp of the big data architecture and the tools needed to design, develop, and implement the data lake, as well as support, really. You should also have a change control process in place because inevitably there will be requests to add components to the architecture. It's not a bad thing unless you're trying to go too far outside of the architecture. That's for another discussion. This will start to sound repetitive now because I've mentioned it a few times already, but you really need mature metadata and governance processes and procedures in place. And you should also have a good portion of your organization's data and the data owners adhering to those processes and procedures. When you're planning your data lake, you not only need backing from that C-suite, but you also need their active participation and support. Sometimes that is the hardest part to get the buy-in on, the actual participation and support. Use cases should be fully vetted with both the business and the IT. And this will keep your project from failing, falling apart early on. And it will also keep the project on keel well into the implementation phase and keep it from failing at the end. Now, while staff and training are very important on the whole, there's three positions that I've listed here that bear really heavy burdens and should be handpicked. First, the infrastructure architects that have been with your organization for a fair bit of time, their knowledge and expertise is critical. Use who you've got. But next, for the big data architect and the data scientist, I have to say, choose wisely. The most technical person may not be the best fit for healthcare. You might be happier choosing someone with a solid healthcare experience and a decent amount of big data experience. Choosing those folks over the candidates with a great big data background and little or no healthcare may leave you with some other issues. Lastly, let's take a look from the implementation perspective. It's important to start with the small digestible use cases. You can use them as POCs, and when they're successful, then they can be promoted through the architecture. This will give you early wins. A big data project is definitely not the time to use a PM who has never worked on a large-scale data project or who doesn't know an entity from an attribute. This PM will also be responsible for keeping your scope creep at bay, so here again I have to say choose wisely. Your first few use cases should involve highly skilled, data savvy users. Believe me, that will pay off when, it, when they start extolling the virtues of your data lake and how great it is to use it. And once again, I'm going to restate the need to ensure that all data relevant to your use cases is loaded into the lake. These are just a few of the best practices and lessons that I've learned over the years and gathered from previous big data projects. There are many more, but I think we're going to start running short on time here. Let's move to the summary. To summarize this, Data Lake makes enormous amounts of raw data available for a myriad of issues. We've shown it to be an integral part of the future of healthcare. And as many of you likely knew before we joined today, it's an endeavor that requires advanced skill sets to initiate, deploy, and grow. Please remember that a solid governance structure will be the key to continually thriving Data Lakes. I think that it was James Dixon, CTO and founder of Pentaho, who described it best when he used the following analogy to explain the concept of a Data Lake. He said, Think of a data mart as a store of bottled water. They're cleansed, packaged, and structured for easy consumption. The data lake is a large body of water in a more natural state from which that water was obtained. The contents of the data lake stream in from sources and fill the lake, and the various users of the lake can come in, examine, dive in, or even take samples. 
Thank you all for your time. Now I'll hand this back to Kate to field any questions you may have. Kate? Great. Thanks a lot, Jill. Uh, we do have some questions that have come in. And just as a reminder, we are going to open up for the call to questions. But if you have any, please put them in the chat box and we will do our best to get to them. So one of the first questions we have here are, um, we are challenged to educate our executive leadership around the value of a data lake investment. Is that something that Perficient can help with? I'll take that one, Kate. Um, absolutely. So through our healthcare strategy and advisory services, we're able to work with organizations to help with the alignment between the need, need for solving use cases, data-driven use cases, and lining those two strategic imperatives. So we have a number of different ways that we can engage, either through education ses sessions, through mini-assessments, or helping to drive strategy and roadmaps around this very question. Great. Thanks, Juliet. Uh, next question, what are the best uses for the data lake versus uh, traditional data warehouse? Um, Jill, is that one that you could take? Yeah, Kate, let me take that one for you. Okay, so I mentioned this briefly in the last couple of slides, but because your data warehouse is structured and processed, it's a great place for those reports that have to be run on time every month. That's the perfect place for it. Your data lake handles your structured, semi-structured, unstructured, all your raw data. Because it has schema on read, it's a good place to go to ask questions or for one and done reports or for things where you know that you're not going to use this going forward, but for the next three months I need to know this set of answers. It's a great place to do the sandboxing. Thanks, Jill. Uh, another question, uh, would you recommend a semantic layer on top of both DWH and Data Lake? I'm going to jump in here, Kate, too. So <laughs> that's a tough call. Um, I do recommend a semantic layer, obviously, on your data warehouse. From the data lake perspective, you want to give your data professionals and your data scientists full access to the raw data. You don't want to hand that over to your business users, or at least not all of your business users. You may want to divide up that access between the folks who you know are really data savvy and won't be dangerous with the data. That's the reason, of course, we use data warehouses, right, to make sure that everybody got the same answer to the same question. But if you've got people who need to be foraging around, who need to be doing data exploration, those are the folks that can go in there with the raw access. However, any other areas that you're going to provide like POCs or if you're going to provide um, you know, temporary data marts or anything that you want the folks in the business to be able to see, go ahead and throw a semantic layer over that. Or if you've got some executives who want to use tools like Tableau that are really great visualization tools, that's another good place to use a semantic layer. All right, great. Um, another question, can I replace my data warehouse with a data lake Hadoop big data warehouse? Okay, so this is one of the things that I talked about in that, uh, what was it, the second to last slide about replacing and putting them in. Yes, you can, absolutely. In fact, what you'll find is that the tools in the market now support that more than ever. I would caution you against that if you've got a lot of operational reporting, though. And again, I'm going to point you to the Winter Corporation study on EDW versus data, uh, big data warehouses. They've done quite a bit of analysis on the use of data, big data over the last, I think, half a dozen years. And they're seeing just a huge cost experience when you eliminate the data warehouse. So depending upon what your situation is, kind of look to that side of it. If you're doing a lot of operational reporting, hang on to your data warehouse. There's no harm, no foul there. If you're all about data exploration, then it might be okay for you to go ahead and keep it with just within the data lake. Thank you, Jill. Well, it looks like that's it for questions. Uh, if we happen to miss your question, we will definitely reach out with an answer uh, in, the, in the near future. And if you come up with any other questions, please feel free to, to contact us. We'd be happy to, to answer those for you and talk through um, any additional information that you would like on data lakes within healthcare. Um, I also encourage you to follow Proficient's team online as we have new information added daily. You can visit Proficient.com and click on the Insights tab for our blogs, white papers, and upcoming web webinars. And thank you again for joining us, and I hope you all have a wonderful day.